my name is Pedro Ramos. Welcome to the Big Cypress National Preserve, one of the public places within the vast Big Cypress Swamp. I live and work here together with thousands of wild and native creatures that call this place home. It has been a tremendous privilege to have worked here for so many years in a place of such rich natural diversity. Please come join me in an adventure through the Big Cypress Swamp. Ours is a water world. From salty seas to freshwater lakes, from the ice caps to the rainforests, from crystal aquifers to the rivers that flow through our veins. Water makes up 70% of the Earth's surface. Who would have guessed that one of the most plentiful things on Earth would suddenly become one of the most valuable? In the new millennium, water and the ecosystems which depend upon it are under siege. This crisis is being played out vividly in our wetlands. South Florida contains some of the most famous wetlands on Earth. Most folks know about the eastern Everglades, made up of a national park and water conservation areas which encompass a sea of grass stretching as far as the eye can see. Less well known and perhaps even more mysterious and varied is its neighbor to the west, the Big Cypress Swamp. Together, these two areas form one huge ecosystem. Today, over a million acres of the richly diverse Everglades in southwest Florida is protected in a variety of public lands. But in the 1960s, this land was slated to be drained and developed, just like many areas of Florida had been over the decades. Through the efforts of those who have a deep connection to this land and had a vision of seeing it protected for years to come, this unique region of the greater Everglades remains intact, a natural area where rare plants and animals can be found, and where people can recreate, escape the hustle and bustle of congested coastal cities, and enjoy the wilds of natural Florida in the Big Cypress Swamp. Cyprus itself is a jigsaw of wildlife refuges, parks, and sanctuaries, recreational areas, private camps, and Native American communities. Some overlap, each has its own character, but all are bound together by a seasonally flowing river, a sheet of living water moving slowly across South Florida and into the Gulf of Mexico. Together, all the public lands in the Big Cypress Swamp region account for over a million acres. Big Cypress National Preserve was created by Congress in 1974, and it's unique in the fact that it's one of the first national preserves within the National Park Service in the United States. And it came about through a compromise between environmentalists and sportsmen's groups and conservationists who all came to the table recognizing that they needed to protect this area of South Florida to ensure the water flow from the Big Cypress Swamp into the 10,000 Islands in Everglades National Park. This was crucial. The original ecosystem had been vast. It started with the water flowing down the Kissimmee River and into Lake Okeechobee. 
During the summer storms, the lake would spill over its lower bank in an enormous sheet. This was the beginning of what author Marjorie Stoneman Douglas called the river of grass. From there, the water would evaporate and form clouds. The winds would blow the clouds west and the water would return as rain. Because the Big Cypress Swamp Basin is a rain-driven system, it is more pristine than other areas of the Everglades, which rely on water from lakes and rivers to the north. Water off this land flows eastward into important water conservation areas and southwest into the 10,000 islands, replenishing and purifying them both. It's a lifesaver, but the system is not undamaged. The public land managers within the Big Cypress Swamp work together to protect the incredible diversity of plant and animal life within its boundaries. One of our most recognizable and elusive residents is the endangered Florida panther. These great cats once roamed over the southeastern United States. By the late 1800s, most had been eradicated. People shot them when they preyed upon livestock. But panthers have also been killed off indirectly through loss of habitat by the relentless encroachment of modern civilization. The male panther typically needs 200 square miles of roaming space, the female 80. Where are they going to find that today? And if they were to disappear, what does that bode for the other critters? The panther is what we call an umbrella species. If the panthers are healthy, so is everything else. If we protect panther habitat, then we protect all the other animals that live within its range, deer, Black bear, bobcat, wild turkey, raccoons and rabbits, wood storks and wading birds, the list goes on. Around the time the panther refuge was created, there were only 20 to 30 Florida panthers left in the wild. There were so few left and they were so isolated, inbreeding had begun to take a toll. Kittens were being born with genetic defects such as heart problems and immune deficiencies. The population seemed doomed. The solution? Mail order brides from Texas. Eight healthy female cougars were imported by wildlife agencies. After two years of having offspring, these Texas cougars were removed. Within 10 years, the panther population tripled. The offspring are considered Florida panthers and are protected by the Endangered Species Act. Today, there are over a hundred panthers that range through the Big Cypress Swamp. While safely sedated, the panthers are fitted with radio collars. This helps biologists track the animal's movements throughout the rest of the year to see which areas they're using as a home range. Blood is taken as well as hair and skin samples so that the health of the species can be carefully monitored. Have we managed to solve all the problems this rare creature faces? Not by a long shot. The panther is not the only charismatic inhabitant of Big Cypress. The Fakahatchee Strand is home to 44 kinds of orchids. Most mysterious of all, is the ghost orchid. I've seen the ghost orchid uh, in a little rain shower and little water droplets will hit it and it'll just bounce like a ballet dancer. We've seen now about 310 different ghost orchids. Fakahatchee is the orchid capital of the United States. It is the largest strand swamp within the Big Cypress Swamp system. Basically, strand swamps are elongated channels or shallow valleys in the limestone that have been eroded over the past 5,000 years. Strand swamps have several features which make it an ideal home for orchids and bromeliads. 
First, there is the water, a seasonally flowing river. In winter, as the leaves fall from the trees, they sink to the bottom and become peat and muck. During the dry season, the riverbed acts as a sponge, releasing moisture and defending the tropical plants against fire and drought. A canopy overhead provides shelter. This green umbrella holds in the humidity and protects the more delicate plants from frost in the coolest months. It's also a shield against the wind and the sun, which can dry everything out with its UV rays. Most of these plants are called epiphytes, which means they grow on trees without causing any harm. They were brought here by migrating birds from South America and the Caribbean islands. Some plants may have arrived on the winds of hurricanes. There is only one known insect which can pollinate the ghost orchid, the giant sphinx moth. When it hatches, the moth will have a six inch wingspan, but its tongue is even longer, which is why some people call it the flying tongue. When the giant sphinx moth flies up to a ghost orchid, it has to ram its head under the anther cap and put its tongue down the long nectar spur of the ghost orchid to get that high energy sugar reward. It's like jet fuel to fuel them to fly to another flower. As the moth feeds, pollen sticks to its head. When the insect visits another orchid and pokes its head under another cap, the pollen comes off. Bingo, the orchid has been fertilized. Every wild adult orchid you see out there is really a winner of the lottery, you know, because the, the chances of any one seed surviving are millions to one. It has to land in just the right place for sunlight and temperature and humidity, and it has to land on fungi. An interaction between the orchid seed and this fungi allows both plants to survive. Was the water hotter or, or cooler? Why? Cooler, you said, Trevor. Why? right here. The staff of the Big Cypress the National here. Preserve and their partners in government work in unison to make education a priority. A lot of them have a lot of fears before they come out. They think this is going to be a big, dark, scary, smelly swamp with all kinds of alligators and snakes and scary things. We go in the classroom beforehand to give a program, and that kind of dispels some of those fears. And then once they get out here and step to this spot and look into the swamp and see this clear water and see how beautiful it is, they, uh, they kind of calm down. We use radio telemetry to track a Florida panther, which is a beanie baby with a radio transmitter on it. They use the same equipment as our biologist uses to track the Florida panther. We use GPS and landmarks to record the location of the panther once we find it. And then we start in doing activities on animals, vegetation, water, soil, and weather. I'm hoping that this gives them that foundation to build on and an interest in, in the natural world and create an awareness that maybe we'll carry through and they can be better stewards in the future. Did you realize that you were coming to a national preserve today? Yes. Yeah, Big Cypress National Preserve. It's part of the National Park Service. One little boy said, you know, I learned from this field trip that there's more to just staying inside and watching TV. It's called paraphyte, and it's really important stuff out here in the swamp. In fact, right here where we are, where the water isn't too deep, this is actually going to dry down. Probably about March, April, May, um, this is going to be really dry. For folks who love the outdoors, the Big Cypress Swamp region offers countless recreational opportunities, including the head of the Florida trail system. If you still want a wellness experience, I can take you out there and show you areas where you can go and have wellness experience. When people get to know that place and come out there, they, some of them get hooked immediately. There's places I guarantee you, you can hike and you're not going to run into anybody.
Old friends Stephen DeLine and James Haas Cartwright are the longtime co-owners of a hunting cabin on the three acres within the preserve. The family camp is a place to relax and to listen to old stories, to hunt and explore the surrounding wilderness. It qualifies as exempt land, and their rights to it are ensured by a congressional mandate which recognizes that hunters and sportsmen worked alongside conservationists and environmentalists to help create the Big Cypress National Preserve. Hunting and off-road vehicle use are allowed within the preserve. Typically, the hunting season takes place in the fall of the year. And then, of course, turkey hunting takes place in the spring of the year. Off-road vehicles are allowed within Big Cypress National Preserve along a designated backcountry trail network. Recreational use continues to allow for traditional pursuits such as hunting and access to backcountry camping. We also provide for the traditional and customary rights of the Miccosukee and Seminole tribes of Florida. Leroy Hanahejo Osceola, a descendant of the famous chief and his wife Cassandra, are raising their family in Big Cypress. I've been teaching them since they were little. They know how to do certain things. I'm getting ready to teach them how to do the silver now. But they do the carving, and they can build uh, the houses, the cheekies, stuff like that. You can't forget where you come from. So that's, to me, it's part of history, what I'm leaving behind. But I can say these words, because I live out here. This is my land. I'm not ashamed to say I love that place. Several of the people that I grew up with and, and people I came to know time or so felt likewise. Some of them were totally uneducated people. They'd fought in the wars, came back. They had all kinds of mental stress from being in Korea, World War II, and that was their sanctuary. That kept them sane. They said going out there and just getting away. I call it the Cypress Cathedral. That's where I find God, feel closest to the Creator, is out there. To the old timers, this is the Big Cypress Swamp. We call this place over here now the Western Everglades. The whole thing, you know, was like visiting the Garden of Eden for a 15-year-old boy. I mean, you know, clouds of birds, and alligators lying in every ditch, and uh, snakes and tarpon rolling in the canals adjacent to Tamiami Trail. I mean, how much better does it get? We just couldn't live without going to the glades, going to the big cypress, going to the bay. It made your heart sing. It enriched us. It made us more than we were. It was great. There's no place else in the world like the Big Cypress Swamp. It's, it's really fantastic. The biological diversity here is incredible. It has great uh, biological productivity because it's a wetland-based system. Now, there's just no place else on the planet where you find this combination of habitats. People ask me all the time, why black and white? When my son was killed and I went to black and white, I started doing it coming from the heart. It keeps everything the same importance. A tree, the sky, the water, it's all variations of, of grays. And it becomes one. And nature is one. So when the black and white brings it to a oneness, 
that you can understand everything is interrelated. Whether the incentive to take care of the big cypress swamp and the Everglades is scientific, recreational, spiritual, or economic, there is profound concern over the future of this priceless ecosystem. Restoration of the South Florida wetlands has stumbled badly in the political and economic climate of the new millennium. The environmentalists, they like to say that the Everglades is a test. You know, if we pass, we may get to keep the planet. It's, it's gonna be a test of our, our scientific ability, you know, our planning ability, test of sustainable development, whether we can say, we can step back a little bit and say, hey, there are some places that man's footprint cannot go. South Florida is the model for multi-billion dollar ecosystem restorations that are supposed to revive the Great Lakes, Puget Sound, the San Francisco Bay Delta, the upper Mississippi River, and Louisiana's coastal wetlands. If we can't save South Florida, you know, the most studied wetland in the world, what can we save? I like to tell people that um, the world's round. Everything we do, everything everybody else does comes around. We don't act conscientiously to do the right thing. Why are other countries gonna do the right thing? South Florida is where we're gonna figure out whether man can live in harmony with nature. Because if Collier County and Miami-Dade County can't figure out how to have enough water for their needs and leave some left over for the gators and panthers and the rest of the bugs and bunnies. It's really hard to imagine that Israel and Syria are going to be able to do it. In the 21st century, water is going to be as precious as oil. Greed and short-sightedness almost destroyed this paradise. But more and more people are waking up to the idea that it's in our own best interest to save these natural places. The drinking water upon which South Florida depends is located in the aquifers under these swamps. The spirit of cooperation has saved Big Cypress Swamp in the past. Its future may depend upon new coalitions between environmentalists and the traditional community between positive local action and promises kept by the federal and state governments. Now, there's already this broad political consensus from right-wingers and left-wingers and buffalo-wingers. Everybody wants to save the Everglades and Big Cypress. And the question is, can we learn to work with each other for a greater good? Can we learn to work in harmony with the environment around us? Will future generations be able to enjoy these natural places as well as we have enjoyed them today? The answer is in you and me.